Yes. Good morning, everybody. As um, administrative director at the Institute of Advanced Sustainability Studies, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Future is Now event, and also to welcome colleagues from Wales. The mission of our institute is to develop transformative knowledge that will pave the way towards sustainable societies. We undertake transdisciplinary and transformative research in cooperation with partners from science, society and policy making, using co-creative methods with the aim of developing solutions to critical sustainability challenges and supporting national and international decision-making processes. The Guide to the Well-Being of Future Generations Act in Wales states that it, and I quote, is about improving the social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being of Wales. It requires public, po public bodies in Wales to think more about the long term, work better with people and communities and each other, look to prevent problems and take a more <laughs> joined up approach, unquote. The synergy between the mission of the ISS and this law is clear. We are therefore very pleased that we have been able to co-create this event with the Welsh Government. The active support of our scientific director and my colleague, Patricia Nanz, has been key to enabling us all to come together today. This was reflected in the original agenda, where she would have been making uh, these opening remarks and also making a key input in the afternoon. Unfortunately, and unfortunately she is unwell and unable to attend. She sends her apologies and is confident that we will have a successful and productive day. Since the mid-20th century, the human footprint has become so profound that we are now the single most decisive factor influence in influencing the development of the Earth system. Human-induced climate change and the spread of foreign substances, such as microplastics, to the remotest places on Earth are among the most prominent impacts of this development. We must re respond to this global transformation by pursuing development pathways that enable us to build globally just, environmentally sustainable, and economi in economically viable societies for the present and the future. Achieving this will require that we align our politics, culture, economy, and technologies with the vision of sustainable development. The scope of this transformation is reflected in the Sustainable Development Goals adopted in the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The ISS committed to advancing these goals. We generate knowledge that supports the transformation towards a sustainable society. The ISS also aspires to undertake transformative research in support of efforts to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. ISS research pro projects study the natural and ecological foundations of sustainable ways of living and examine how, the, how, how these goals can be achieved within the complex political, economic and cultural context of modern societies. Last September, the United Nations called for a decade of action in order to meet the SDGs. Two months into this decade, this new dec decade, we have now co-created this event with the Welsh Government to explore how we can respond to that call. We are very pleased um, that research by colleagues from the ISS contributing to, the, to, to, to today's discussion, for instance, on, topic, on topics like energy transition, the challenges of post-coal transition, and the Berlin Mobility Law. I thank everyone who was involved in setting up this event, especially, of course, Mike Palmer, uh, for his initiative and who, are who we are very proud to have as a fellow at our institute right now, and of course the Welsh Government for this cooperation. I wish us all a productive and informative day that succeeds in identifying pathways for increasing the speed and scale of our response to the United Nations 2030 Agenda on for Sustainable Development. Thank you very much. Good morning, Boroda. Good morning to everyone, and a warm welcome. It's lovely to see so many people here this morning, um, and a huge uh, welcome also to the, those joining online. Uh, we're really, really pleased to be working with the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies to bring you this event today, and thanks very much to Jakob for stepping in at the last moment and giving us that fantastic speech. 
Um, as Jakob has said, we are at the start of the UN decade of action towards the Sustainable Development Goals, and we're really looking forward to sharing with you our experience of legislating for sustainable development through the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. But we're also really, really keen to learn from you. So we're particularly pleased that we've got such a lot of speakers from Germany and Wales that can share our experiences, our solutions in facing the huge global challenges that we have. So I'm very grateful also for everyone for travelling here, but particularly for my Welsh colleagues, um, many of whom have travelled by train to reduce our carbon footprint. And I know it was a long journey, so, so a big thanks to you. So let me just briefly take you through some information uh, for the day. So for those of you who haven't seen it, we have the Attendify app, and I would really urge you to use that. Um, it's great. It'll keep you informed, tell you all about the speakers, the agenda. Obviously, the reason we've done this is so that we don't have lots of paper. So again, reducing our carbon footprint. It allows you to put, post messages, join in conversations. Um, so can I ask you all to download that app through your phone, your devices, or through your web browser? And for those joining online as well, really useful for you to do that. Uh, if you go on, if once you've downloaded it, you just search for the future is now. And I think we have the code there that you then put in. And those joining us remotely will have had those instructions. There's no fire alarm set for today, so if a fire alarm does go, can you make your way out of the door, please? We'll be there to, to guide you. Turn right down to the door, left, and then we assemble on the bridge, but we will guide you. The restrooms and accessible restrooms are out in the foyer. You probably saw those. Coffee and lunch will be served outside this room in the lovely uh, foyer area. Um, and over lunch, we've got a rapid networking event, and we'd really urge you, if you could pick up your lunch and go into the rooms, the two rooms we're going to be using for workshops are directly to the right, uh, and there will be colleagues in there sharing their experiences of sustainable development in Wales, a, a chance for you to ask questions and share your experiences as well. So please just take your, your lunch with you. Um, you, won't, you can't possibly have missed that there's been uh, a inc really increased focus on the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. So just to remind you, please, to just uh, use the coughing and sneezing etiquette into, into uh, tissues which you throw away and into the crook of your arm if, if you uh, are caught unawares, um, washing your hands. Uh, we would say probably refrain from shaking hands. Uh, further advice was sent out to you, so hopefully you've had that. So... Again, warmly welcoming those joining us online through live stream. We've got 70 people signed up. So again, fantastic to have people joining us virtually as well, face to face. Any technical problems, please let us know through the Attendify app. And we also gave you instructions to, to contact us if there's any problem. Um, you are also going to have the opportunity to participate in an online workshop when we here in Berlin break out into workshops. So I'd urge you to do that because I think it's going to be really interesting. Uh, and uh, I think all your joining instructions have been sent out to you. So uh, I am going to move on to say to you that in terms of the First Minister, I'm really sorry to have to tell you that the First Minister is not able to join us today. Um, due to stepping up the coronavirus preparations in the UK, he has had to return to Wales today to, uh, to, to be involved in meetings there, um, had to curtail his trip. So he asked me to say that he's really sorry that he can't be with us and wishes us every success for this event. The First Minister has asked Dr Jane Davidson and the Future Generations Commissioner Sophie Howe to represent him, and they've kindly agreed to do that. But what I would like to do now is to show you a film address from the Right Honourable Mark Drakeford AM, First Minister of Wales, where he's talking about the Future Generations Act. I'm going to bear with me because I'm going to put my glasses on so I can do this. So one of the ways in which I think the founders of devolution in Wales were genuinely innovative and radical is that from the very beginning they built the sustainable development principle into the very foundations of this new democratic institution. And that meant that from the very beginning politicians here and the people who advise them have had to grapple with the way in which the decisions we make today have an impact on the futures that will come beyond us. Now, about halfway through the 20 years we've had a National Assembly for Wales, people began to wonder whether we were interpreting the principle rather narrowly, thinking of it mostly in the environmental field, and whether there were ways we could act 
to make sure that the same basic approach applied right across the work of the government. And that's how you end up with, in the second decade of devolution, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Now, the Act sets seven goals, and they cut across everything the Welsh Government does, whether that's creating a more healthy uh, Wales, a more prosperous Wales, an outward-looking Wales, a Wales where our language thrives, whether it's creating a more equal Wales. That has put that sustainable development principle right at the heart of Welsh Government and right across everything we do. And I think that's how you see how the UN goals have made such an impact on the way we've gone about things in Wales. Well, the first thing to say is that public bodies in Wales, and that's not just the Welsh Government, but it's public bodies of all sorts and in all parts of Wales, generally share the ambitions of the Act. They don't need persuading that the decisions we make today must be thought through because of the impact they have on people who come after us tomorrow. Now, of course, we've got to turn that goodwill into practical action, so we need a way of reporting on what bodies do, monitoring what they do, and of course the Commissioner, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act Commissioner that we established here in Wales alongside the Act, has a really important job to do, holding the Welsh Government to account, holding public bodies in Wales to account, and being a critical friend of the work that we are embarked upon here, because I don't think it's a problem of motivation. People want to do the right thing. We need to make sure we have the mechanisms in place to help people to do that. Well, the priorities are to translate the intentions of the Act into practical impact on the ground, to make sure that the Act has an impact on budgets, for example, the way we spend our money. Uh, but the other ambition for the years ahead is to harness behind the Act, not just government, and not just public bodies, but that enormous enthusiasm there is in wider Welsh society behind the ambitions that the Act sets down and our wish as a nation to be somewhere where sustainable development principles bite across everything we do. So reaching out beyond the bodies and the formalities of the Act, harnessing the ambitions, the motivation, the determination of wider civil society, that's another agenda for the next decade. Devolution in Wales is very new. It's only been going 20 years, and primary law-making powers have been here for less than a decade. So to have put this Act on the statute book as one of the early and defining pieces of legislation, uh, I think it is something that people will look back on in years to come and say they really were ambitious they really meant what they said, and this act will be something that we'll be proud of. Thank you for bearing with me there. Uh, IT is not my strong point. Um, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce Dr Jane Davidston. She is a former Welsh Government Minister and she was the absolute driving force behind the need to have legislation in Wales. She is now Pro Vice Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Wales Trinity St David's and we are so pleased that she's able to join us today. Note how good I am at IT as well. <laughs> um, Amelia and Andrew, thank you very much. Um, uh, good morning uh, to you all. And um, I'm particularly delighted to be joining colleagues from uh, Germany and Wales uh, at this event. And uh, a huge warm welcome to those of you who are joining us online as well. Um, I think that what I should say at the beginning, before anybody thinks that I'm better that I am than I am in the context of the act, is sometimes as a politician, it's really good just to not be prepared to allow anyone to say no to you. <laughs> 
It's a really good way of getting things done. And I think that in many ways, the journey I'm going to describe to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, a journey of 20 years in 10 minutes, is actually just because I wouldn't allow people to tell me it couldn't be done. So that's the philosophy on which I want to start. And I also want to start with two um, very short epiphanies that were very important to me in the development of this agenda. One of them was from a woman called Professor Donella Meadows. Now, many people who have been involved in policy around sustainable development for the years will know about Donella. Um, she was key in establishing the Sustainability Institute uh, in the United States. She published in 1972 a book called The Limits to Growth. It was initiated by the Club of Rome, and she was asked to look at, at uh, the consequences of unchecked growth on a finite planet. 1972. I was about 14 when this happened. And she thought at that point that as a scientist, if she brought evidence to the world, it would understand that politicians, that governments would understand that they needed to do something. And therefore, in the limits to growth, she really sounded an alarm about the consequences of unchecked growth. But she also framed the idea that in terms of engaging with people, you couldn't do it unless there were five softer tools involved. And those tools are visioning, networking, truth-telling, learning, and loving. And I'm going to frame what I say today in the context of Donella Tools. Because in 1992, the same year as the first Earth Summit, she published her second revolutionary book, which was called Beyond the Limits, where she demonstrated unequivocally that society had gone into overshoot, a state of being beyond limits. We are overshooting such crucial resources as food and water while overwhelming nature with pollutants like those causing global warming, and that a sustainable future will require profound social and psychological readjustments in the developed and developing world. In her third book, Limits to Growth, the 30-Year Update, published in 2002, she said that those five key elements that back in the 1970s she thought were optional were absolutely essential characteristics for any society that hopes to survive over the long term. Each of those elements, visioning, networking, truth-telling, learning, and loving, exists within a network of positive loops. Thus, their persistent and constant application initially by a relatively small group of people, whales, would have the potential to produce enormous change, even to challenge the present system, perhaps helping to produce a revolution. So I hope that everybody here today is up for a revolution <laughs> because we still haven't got there and this learning event needs to do exactly that. So let's start with visioning, where visioning means taking off the constraints of feasibility of disbelief and past disappointments and letting your mind dwell upon its most noble, uplifting and treasured dreams. You heard the First Minister say just now, and the First Minister has been an enormously strong advocate of this act uh, ever since he was a special advisor to the uh, previous First Minister. Very odd route into politics, that, but he was the lead special advisor uh, for First Minister Rodri Morgan, um, who has been one of the key minister, uh, First Ministers in Wales in the context of devolution. But Mark supported very strongly the idea of putting sustainable development at the centre of the new National Assembly's work. And we were able to do that because we were the only part of the United Kingdom that was given a duty to promote sustainable development in our foundation legislation. 
And we decided right from the beginning that we were going to use the Brundtland Commission definition of sustainable development from our common futures, the one on the screen, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the, the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. <clears throat> The requirement in the legislation meant we had to have a scheme, and as one of the first Assembly members, I, I, I was very privileged to join the Assembly in 1999 when, when, when it first started. Um, we had to have a scheme for each administration, and then ensuing administrations reviewed that scheme. And our first scheme was called Learning to Live Differently. And all these schemes you can pick up by going back onto the Welsh Government website if you want to look at the content uh, of the schemes. And we said then that we wanted learning to live differently to be the overarching framework for all the Assembly's work. But I have to say at that particular point, we had no powers. <laughs> that the Assembly had been established with no powers um, in, in Wales. And it took a number of years. In fact, not until 2011 did the Assembly um, actually acquire proper legislative powers. So initially, think of us as a big council of people who knew they wanted to behave in a certain way, but didn't have the tools in terms of taking that forward. So the second scheme, starting to live differently in 2004, laid out 10 key actions in areas which could be achieved within the powers of the Assembly. But then people said, well, 10 key actions is not a central organising principle. It's 10 key actions, but you're not joining up this. You're not making this the heart of government. So the third scheme, the one for which I was responsible in 2009, we called One Wales, One Planet. And what we aimed to do there was develop a pathway to bringing down the ecological footprint of Wales so that we actually did not use more resources than the single planet we had available to us. And I had a ball. I mean, it was brilliant. We went out with massive public consultation, huge civil society engagement, and I can honestly say I th still think that the One Wales, One Planet document is one of the best that the uh, Assembly government has ever produced, because I didn't write it. <laughs> And enormous inputs from all political parties, from civil society, from academia and others contributed towards that. And the importance of that, and that document is still available if you want to look at it, is it's that is what is now turned into law in the context of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Because what I realised, along with Rodri Morgan, um, who's uh, our First Minister, uh, who said sustainable development is not an option that will go away, it is the only way forward. What I realised is that you may think that with a manifesto commitment and ministerial support and colleague cabinet support and support of the senior civil service, that it is enough. And that's all absolutely necessary. But it is not sufficient and it is not sufficient because unless the cultural principles around what you're trying to do change, then actually you are basically trying to run a different kind of system within a system that is going in the opposite direction. And that's when I realised we needed legislation. So my parting gift as a politician was to propose that legislation for government. That legislation went into the manifesto in March 2011, and I pay absolute tribute to my political colleagues because they were prepared to put it into the programme for government, which meant it then moved on uh, a trajectory towards legislation. And this slide lays out um, the journey of legislation. It looks similar in any country. Um, although, of course, what was different is nobody had ever done this before. So, although I wanted it to be the first piece of legislation that was made in the 2011 administration, um, I had to be gently told that when you're doing something that nobody's ever done before, you need a bit of time. And not least since 2011 was the first point at which the, uh, the incoming government had legislative powers. 
And therefore, they need to learn how to use those legislative powers as well. So in fact, it became the last piece of legislation, but it had been thought through and the massive engagement across the whole of Wales with the Wales We Want exercise, paralleling the world we want to exercise uh, around the SDGs. But look at Donella Meadows' quote there. A network is non-hierarchical. It is a web of connections among equals held together not by force, obligation, material incentive or social contract, but by shared values and the understanding that some tasks can be accomplished together that could never be accomplished separately. This could not have been done top down. It had to be about engagement at all levels. It had to be about the partnerships in terms of delivery. And many times it had a difficulty. There were actually propositions at one point in the, in the middle of the cycle to bin the bill. Uh, people were concerned, as Mark said, that it was just another environmental impediment. And what we was not going to do was actually add anything societally, economically or culturally to Wales. So... It was a long journey, but at the end, we got there. And this, in uh, very shorthand, is the, uh, is the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. It's not just environmental, social and economic, as those of us who've worked with sustainable development for years see as the three pillars. That cultural um, domain within it is absolutely critical. As Mark says, there are seven goals. They're all interrelated. And importantly, the five ways of working are integrated into the legislation. So people have to work towards the long term. They have to work preventatively. They have to integrate how their well-being objectives impact upon the well-being goals or other objectives and on the objectives of public bodies. It's, you know, it's a very kind of legal concept, but basically they have to integrate their thinking. They have to collaborate with each other and they have to involve people with an interest in achieving the well-being goals. So no policy about us without us. That old philosophy that uh, Ruth Marx, uh, here from the Wales Council for Voluntary Action, must have said in her sleep a million times. And here are the goals. Um, and those goals are different to the way that you'd normally describe policy. And if I just read you the first, because this is the goal that excites me so. A prosperous Wales is an innovative, productive and low carbon society which recognises the limits of the global environment and therefore uses resources efficiently and proportionately, including acting on climate change, and which develops a skilled and well-educated population in an economy which generates wealth and provides employment opportunities, allowing people to take advantage of the wealth generated through securing decent work. Innovative, low carbon, recognising the limits of global environment, decent work. That is now law in Wales. Show me another country where its prosperity is defined in law in that way. And it links over to the SDGs as well. So that, uh, for example, this is an example in the context of resilient Wales and looking at how it maps on to the SDGs. But this is not the end. Making legislation, although the UN said how wonderful Wales was for making it, it is not the end. Donella, truth-telling, a system cannot function well if its information streams are corrupted by lies. Not unrelieved pessimism, not sappy optimism, but the resolve to tell the truth. And above all, the courage to admit and bear the pain of the present while keeping a steady eye on a vision of a better future. So, core oversight of changing behaviour sits with Welsh Government, sits with the Future Generations Commissioner, sits with the Wales Audit Office, and sits with the courts. All of those have a fundamental role in looking at how this Act can become an Act for the future. And I'm just going to leave you with two points. Learning is about learning from others. But these five areas I hope that we will explore today. Leadership for delivery is key. The Act needs to become a People's Act. 
Government needs to create the right support and financial mechanisms. Learning from others is important, and nature has rights too. And if you just look at this slide as I stand down now, the sustainability revolution will have to be, above all, a collective transformation that permits the best of human nature, rather than the worst, to be expressed and nurtured. And the quote below from Donella Meadows shows, if we allow extractive industries, the world will collapse. If there is not enough time, the world will collapse. But if the limits are real and close and there's no time to waste and there's just enough energy, enough material, enough money, enough environmental resilience and enough human virtue to bring about a planned reduction in the ecological footprint of humankind, a sustainable revolution is a much better world for the vast majority. And if you want to know more, my book is out in May. Thank you very much. Jochen Vau, Jane, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, and That was fantastic. I think it's really set us up for the day. And talking about sharing experiences, understanding more how we can take this whole agenda forward, we're about to move into workshops. Um, so what we're going to have is two workshops before the coffee break, two workshops after the coffee break. The rooms are directly to your right. These are the, the workshops up on the screen. So you literally walk out of here, turn right. Ruben is the first room. Aquamarin is the second room. So cho please choose your workshop. If one is absolutely full, please go to the other. But otherwise, it's your choice which one you'd like to go to. Um, we're going to have about an hour in there. The first session will last till about 10.55. Uh, then we'll have a coffee break, and then we'll ask you to go back into the second one, starting at about 11.10. Uh, and then if you come back into this room for 12.15, that'd be great. Thank you very much. So if you'd like to wait, make your way to the workshops now, that'd be great. Thank you.